Paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. But if you would tell me who I am, at least take the trouble to discover what I have been. The search for identity is the American theme. The nature of our society is such that we are prevented from knowing who we are. It is still a young society, and this is an integral part of its development. Everybody wants to tell us what a Negro is, yet few wish, even in a joke, to be one. Ellison's novels basically have basic, the basic themes of race, identity and spirituality. He also have, have captured uh, universal themes. The themes of the struggle of humankind, innocence, those kinds of themes that any individual in the world can identify with. It had a great impact on African Americans because it did relate uh, their culture our experience, our search for identity. In 1969, he was awarded the Medal of Freedom by President Lyndon Johnson. But if you would tell me who I am, at least take the trouble to discover what I have been. Oklahoma was once the home of American Indians, forced westward by the federal government in the 1830s. When the Oklahoma Territory was opened for settlement in 1899, it offered African Americans a chance for a new beginning in a state without history of slavery or segregation. From the 1890s through the early 1900s, thousands of African Americans and whites moved to Oklahoma and took advantage of vast amounts of undeveloped land. Many whites brought their prejudices with them and established Jim Crow laws that separated the races. Despite these laws, there was still greater opportunity for African Americans than in the Deep South. Ralph Ellison's parents were among the many that moved to this region from Tennessee to escape poverty. They settled in Oklahoma City, where Ellison was born on March 1, 1914. During this era, Many films, such as the 1915 spectacle, Birth of a Nation, branded African Americans as subhuman. The physical hardships and indignities of slavery were benign compared with this continuing debasement of our image. In the struggle against Negro freedom, motion pictures have been one of the strongest instruments for justifying some white Americans' anti-Negro attitudes and practices. His mother worked as a domestic worker in homes of affluent whites and often carried home magazines for Ellison. This reading broadened his perspective 
and motivated him to consider going beyond his limited environment. This also caused Ellison to believe achievement could lift him out of his meager conditions. His father enjoyed reading, and one of his favorite writers was Ralph Waldo Emerson. He named his son after Emerson because he wanted him to be a writer. Lewis Ellison didn't live to see this. In 1817, he was killed on a construction site where he was a supervisor. His wife, Ida, had to raise their two young sons alone. Ellison knew about his father's great interest in Emerson and that he had been named after the writer. Later, after Ellison grew older, he read Emerson's work titled Self-Reliance, which expressed the philosophy that the individual was responsible for his destiny and he adopted this belief. After Ellison's mother managed to save enough money to buy him a used coronet, he took a serious interest in music. During his youth, he trained daily to reach his goal of being a jazz musician by playing in his local high school band and studying music by legends Duke Ellington and Louis Armstrong. His dedication was rewarded with a music scholarship to Tuskegee Institute in Alabama, where he studied from 1933 to 1936. At college, his part-time job in the library also opened avenues to study. When he was 20 years old, he read a poem by T and was inspired to start writing poetry. For the first time, Ellison considered being a writer. The wasteland seized my mind. I was intrigued by its power to move me while eluding my understanding. Somehow its rhythms were often closer to those of jazz than were those of the Negro poets. And even though I could not understand them, its range of illusion was as mixed and varied as that of Louis Armstrong, and thus began my conscious education in literature. This helped him to understand that he could translate the same message in literature that he was able to do through music. Ellison's obsession about his existence drove him. He read many books by writers such as Ernest Hemingway, James Joyce, and Ezra Pound. His study of music gave him the discipline, the organization to focus, but he loved writing. He enjoyed it just as he did music. At the end of his junior year in 1936, he traveled to Harlem, New York, with a plan to stay for the summer, to work and save enough money to return to school in the fall. Black life in Harlem during that period, it was the Depression. Um, blacks, it was not the Harlem of 1914 to 1917, where blacks rushed to New York because they knew that there were going to be jobs there. It was the Great Migration, the 1920s, the Renaissance, the time of rebirth of African American culture. In 1936, it basically was a place where blacks were attempting to survive, uh, to maintain even some of the gains that they had made during the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, Ellison was there, he had to do odd jobs. He wasn't able to find anything better than part-time jobs that paid poorly. And when the summer ended, he hadn't made enough money he needed. He decided to stay in Harlem. Through the very process of slavery came the building of the United States. Our Negro situation is changing rapidly, but so much which we've gleaned through the harsh discipline of Negro American life is simply too precious to be lost. I speak of the faith, the patience, the humor. These are some of the things through which we've confronted the obstacles in which we fail not adapt to change conditions, lest we destroy ourselves. Times change, but these possessions must endure forever. Not simply because they define us as a group, but because they represent a further instance of man's triumph over chaos. On the steps of the YMCA, Ellison met writers Langston Hughes and Alain Locke. Soon after, when Hughes found out about Ellison's fascination with literature, he arranged for him to meet novelist Richard Wright in 1936. Impressed by Ellison's wide knowledge about many subjects, Wright assigned him to write a book review for the magazine he was editing. Soon after, Wright encouraged Ellison to try writing fiction, and he began his first attempt at short stories. By 1938, Wright's national success enabled him to gain influence, which he used to help Ellison 
and other African Americans to get jobs with the Federal Writers Project. There was still that ability to go to Harlem and to achieve uh, that kind of uh, pursuit, those intellectual goals. As far as economic survival, it was not very good for African Americans politically or, and the only thing I think that blacks could hold on to without uh, just sinking into hopelessness was the cultural aspect. Uh, that was one thing. They still could become creative. Uh, they still could get some of their works published. Ellison left four years later after being hired as managing editor of the Negro Quarterly magazine. He stayed until 1943, then joined the Merchant Marines. After being honorably discharged in 1944, he won a $1,500 fellowship to write a novel published the same year. The next year, he started work on Invisible Man, a novel about a young man's struggle to assert his identity. During the years he worked on the novel, he was in and out of various jobs and for long periods didn't work at all in order to concentrate on his writing. Ellison's wife carried the burden of supporting them and when he got discouraged, she encouraged him to keep going because she believed in his writing career. Seven years later, he completed his novel and was worn out and filled with worries that his years of persistence might not pay off. Invisible Man was on the bestseller list for 13 weeks, and its huge success suddenly shot Ellison to the top of the literary field. In 1953, he received the National Book Award, one of America's most prestigious literary prizes. The book's popularity led to Ellison being selected as a fellow at the American Academy of Arts and Letters in Rome two years later. Basically, if you are without economic power in America, you are without, you are invisible to a certain extent. African Americans uh, basically found it very difficult and still find it very difficult in many instances to be identified as a person of merit. In 1964, he published Shadow and Act, a collection of essays written early in his career. With earnings up by 1967, Ellison purchased the spacious country home in Plainfield, Massachusetts that his wife had dreamed about since their early years of their marriage. Later that same year in November, tragedy struck when a fire ruined his property and destroyed nearly 350 pages of a second novel. The 1960s was a turbulent period when African Americans struggled for human rights and pressed into being a national civil rights bill. He has been criticized, or was criticized, by many of the radicals of the 60s and the 70s because they felt that Ellison should identify more with Africa. But what Ellison did was take uh, the American culture and the African American culture and said that you basically could not separate the two, that both have borrowed and intermingle with each other so on a culture level. You, one could not uh, distinguish and say this is solely African American culture because African American culture is a combination of Africans in America and American culture. For no group within the United States achieves anything without asserting its claims against the counterclaims of other groups. Thus as Americans we have accepted this conscious and ceaseless struggle as a condition of our freedom. And we are aware that each of our victories increases the area of freedom for all Americans, regardless of color. I see a period when Negroes are going to be wandering around because we have had this thing thrown at us for so long that we haven't had a chance to discover what in our background is really worth preserving. For the first time, we are given a choice we are making a choice, and this is where the real trouble is going to start. Freedom must be won again and again. Ellison continued to be recognized for his literary achievements. In 1969, he was awarded the Medal of Freedom by President Lyndon Johnson. The next year, Ellison was named Professor of Humanities at New York University. Ellison took a trip back to his hometown in 1975 when the city named a branch library after him. I have no doubt that within these walls, other writers, black, white, Indian, 
will emerge. The library is a place where we are able to free ourselves from the limitations of today by becoming acquainted with what went on in the past and thus project ourselves into the future. He was honored in 1985 with the National Medal of Arts Award and the next year his essays were published in Going to the Territory. The diversity of American life is often painful, frequently burdensome, and always a source of conflict. But in it lies our fate and our hope. You just write for your own time while trying to write in terms of the density of experience, knowing perfectly well that life repeats itself. Even in this rapidly changing United States, it repeats itself. The mystery is that while repeating itself, it always manages slightly to change its mask. His unfinished work, Lost in the Fire, was never completed. Ellison died of pancreatic cancer in his home in New York City on April 16, 1994. When we read Ellison, Ellison loves American folklore, African-American folklore and art. In his work, he gives the spiritual side of African-Americans, that aspect of African-Americans that revitalizes the community, the creativity, the joy, which comes out of the culture, uh, the self-awareness. Now, Ellison gives us self-awareness. Then comes the writers of the 60s and 70s who say self-determination. We are going to determine our future. So his legacy is that he is the connecting link. Uh, he gets us from uh, invisibility he, to pro, from protest into self-determination. And I think that's his greatest contribution.